Our last session will focus on the fight for economic and social inclusion. The mission of the Ford Foundation is to work with leaders and organizations worldwide to change social structures so that all people have a voice and live in dignity. So how are human rights contributing to that? How much progress have we made in ensuring human rights for all? Have the poorest and most marginalized benefited from the human rights achievements in the same way that those who are doing better? We have an amazing panel today to, to address these questions, so let me invite Liz Suzette to lead us in this vital conversation. I want to hear a big hello. <laughs> See, I knew human rights activists are, this is an unpronounceable word for me, so I never use it on the BBC, indefatigable. <laughs> My name is Lise Doucette. I work for the BBC, and I, I want to say that since this is described as beyond conventions, if you're going to come up with a new convention, the next human rights convention should say that it is a human right that at these sort of events that no one should appear after Desmond Tutu. He should always <laughs> be the last speaker. Mm -hmm. A, you cannot take on Desmond Tutu, and as Madeleine Albright saw, you cannot take on God. You just can't. <laughs> we are the last panel of the day, but it is the panel that we all want you to go away and think hard about. We want you to think hard about it now, but this is the panel that looks towards the future. What's its title? Paths to Prosperity. Now, we all wish that the path to prosperity was a four-lane highway, but unfortunately for most people and in most places, it isn't. And in fact, in many places, and for many of the people that all of you here work with, there is no path at all. So what then is the role of human rights organizations, traditional and new, to actually find those paths and to help people along them? Now, I suppose if this is going to be the way it's framed, we would love to have Formula One drivers here, or even Tour de France. But failing that, we have best of advocates and activists who are going to discuss this. It's going to be a conversation, and we do want to bring you in on the conversation as well. And we're going to begin at the far corner with Kenneth Roth. Everyone should give Kenneth Roth a hard time, don't you think? <laughs> what else is new? What have we been saying a lot of today? We were reminded by Desmond Tutu, you know, that great expression, you've come a long way, baby. There has been a lot of progress when it comes to political rights, when it comes to democracy. It's not perfect, but progress has been made in the last 75 years. But what about looking forward? There is a sense now in which economic rights, poverty, marginalization, these are the issues that still really matter. Where are these voices? Are they being heard? Kenneth Roth, do you think that as you look forward now, that actually traditional human rights organizations like yours have to broaden the terrain in terms of your battle for human rights to include, in a greater sense, the fight for economic inclusion, the fight against poverty? Yeah. Well, we've been working intensively on economic and social rights for at this stage, 18 years. Um, and, and if you go to our website, you'll look in and you'll see you know, an entire division of the organization focused on the right to health. Um, you'll see major campaigns focusing on the right to education. Um, we've looked at worker rights from, say, migrant domestic workers in the Middle East to farm workers in Kazakhstan to, to child farm workers in this country. You know, so we take on a broad range of issues um, already. And, and for us, the biggest challenge has actually been methodological, because there are certain kinds of economic and social rights issues that um, the methodology that Human Rights Watch is known for works very well with. And there are other things where it doesn't. Um, but there are other methodologies. And I think that it's important to recognize that um, you know, even though the name Human Rights Watch you know, suggests that we should do everything, um, you know, every organization has to kind of pick what it's good at. When you say methodology, just give us a concrete example. Well, I mean, you know, basically we are in the business of putting pressure on particular entities. 
that entity could be a government, it could be a corporation, it could be a rebel group. It's you know, whoever has power, basically, whoever is making decisions that affect people's lives. And we generate pressure. We do that in part by shaming them, in part by um, diplomatic pressure, in part by economic pressure. I mean, there are a range of kinds of pressure that, that we put on our targets. But for our methodology to work, there has to be a target that is responsible. So if the question is, you know, who is um, you know, refusing to take money and build schools in this area where there are no schools, you can usually figure out who's responsible. And you can target that, that government, that entity, what have you. Um, if the issue is who's responsible for poverty, that's a different issue. You know, and and, and it, you sort of have to define the problem in a way that, at least you know, for our methodology, we can do something about. So if, you know, to, to tackle global poverty or to promote global human dignity, those are not things that the Human Rights Watch methodology works very well for. Now, there are other methodologies available, and I think it's important to recognize that the sort of traditional human rights movement does not have a monopoly on methods to promote human rights because you can have popular mobilization. You can have, you know, you can elect candidates who are going to further your issue. Um, you, you, there, there are many, many tools out there to promote economic and social rights. And so we shouldn't limit our vision. You know, frankly, you could be, you know, create a development organization and provide direct services that helps to realize economic and social rights. So let's recognize that there's a, a proliferation of ways to go about realizing an economic social rights, some of which the, the pressure tools that Human Rights Watch is known for work well for, and others we have to look to partners. And that, that's a division of labor that frankly exists in the civil and political rights mm -hmm. realm as well. Yes. And, and we, we shouldn't fight that. We should allow each organization to do what it does well. But you know, the, the, coming back to the beginning of your question, um, I completely agree that economic and social rights have to be a key part of not only the, the human rights agenda, but of Human Rights Watch's agenda. Well, so that is the point that you have raised, the division of labor. Whose job is it? I'm going to swing around and bring in Hussam Bagat, who heads uh, an organization with a terrific title, which is the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Human Rights. And you have, by any standard, a huge agenda, whether it's right to privacy, right to health, right to religious freedom, sexual freedom. You probably don't get any sleep as it is. In fact, I know you don't get any sleep. <laughs> do, do you, when you were sitting in Egypt in, during these last momentous months, did you wake up in the dark of night and say, actually, I should add economic rights to my agenda too, or else I'm failing in my mandate? They've always been there. Uh, there was no uh, point that, uh, where we thought, you know, let's focus on this one branch of human rights. Because, for instance, when we first started working on the right to bodily integrity, on um, issues of sexual and reproductive rights, of the right to privacy, we realized that it would be incomplete and lacking to focus only on these and not include the right to health and discrimination that people are subjected to because of a mental health disorder, because of their HIV status, or in Egypt because of hepatitis C, where we have the, the highest infection rate in the world and where that is used um, to justify discrimination that's very similar to HIV-based discrimination in, in, sub <coughs> Sorry, in sub saharan Africa. And so for us, um, it's always been clear. The revolution, of course, made it much clearer. I mean, y you know that the, the slogan in the invitation that was being circulated for January 25th, the first day of our revolution, had the slogan was um, bread, freedom, um, human dignity. Aish Horea Karama in Seneya. And, uh, and I, I think that's, a, that's an excellent way to summarize uh, the, our human rights agenda and, in my view, the human rights agenda. Bread plus freedom would equal dignity, um, human dignity, and, and social justice. And, uh, and uh, it, you know, one could spend a very long time talking about how human rights are interrelated, how they are interdependent, how, you know, there is no artificial separation between uh, civil and political rights and economic and social rights. But in um, our place, you know, in, in, I mean, we were all profoundly, of course, affected by the events since January. And uh, all one needed to do is to just look around and see, you know, all these hundreds of thousands of people chanting this slogan to know that you know, this has always been true, that this is not a theoretical uh, proposition, that this is what mobilized people. And the event since Mubarak was unseated in February proved this again, that you know, people are focused on wages, labor strikes are um, reaching an unprecedented hike, unprecedented even compared to the Mubarak time, even though Mubarak has been unseated. But, but do you think the human rights organizations have been part of that battle? Because you know, even though it was a three-part slogan, 
if you went into the square, there was that huge banner in, with the Arabic script, leave. Mubarak was one of the major issues. Elections have become a major issue. Yes, there are lots of strikes going on, but do you sometimes feel that the human rights are, are leaving those workers, the poorest, behind? Because you're focusing on other things. They want jobs, they want to feed their families. Mm. But you've got a lot of other things to focus on, and I know a lot of you are focusing on, as you should. Uh, the record is, is a mixed one. Uh, so before the revolution, uh, I mean, obviously, the, the focus was on uh, you know, the systematic torture, the uh, extrajudicial executions, you know, the state of emergency, all of this, and, um, and I think rightfully so. But at the same time, the revolution would not have happened without the labor movement that started in 2007, and, and our human rights community was out there to provide legal assistance, legal awareness to all the independent human rights union. Um, um, the, the cause that brought the human rights um, uh, movement, uh, sorry, the, the labor rights movement together was um, uh, around a court case to establish uh, a minimum wage, um, and that was filed by a human rights organization and acted as really the catalyst, uh, as, the, as the convening factor for the labor movement that then contributed to the revolution. And so the record, I would say, is mixed, but I, I would agree also with, with Ken that um, uh, it's not always easy for the human rights organization to, uh, to get into economic and social rights because one needs to be much more creative. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, uh, the equation becomes more sophisticated than you know, uh, violator, violation, victim, uh, which is the easy, straightforward, um, uh, often equation in, in, uh, in uh, civil and political rights. So for instance, before the revolution, we brought a court case, we challenged um, Mubarak's attempt to uh, privatize the health insurance system. Mm -hmm. And international law, international human rights law, the conventions that we're trying to move beyond, say absolutely nothing on the subject. They say the state should provide health care. That could happen through public health insurance or could happen through private providers. It was up to us to really do the calculations, to do the studies, mm -hmm. to prove that privatizing the health insurance system that was established in the 1960s would make health care unattainable, un aff aff affordable to the people that needed health care. The conventions don't really help uh, that much, but the human rights language is very compelling and got the court to listen to us. Uh, but then you need to go the extra step. Mm. Do you sense a trend emerging? We've had two speakers, very active in their fields. They're saying, yes, we understand it's important. It's not easy. It's hard because of what we do or because of the way it works, but we're not finished yet. We're going to bring in Someone from an earlier struggle, we're going to bring in some feisty women. It's always a good answer. Uh, Nkosi Kalala, who works with, anti, uh, with the um, fighting against AIDS, the treatment action campaign. Of course, you know in South Africa, many are now asking, what did the end of apartheid bring me? What is our revolution a long time before the Egyptian revolution? What do you say? What is your answer to the debate that we're now having? Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate, I think, to some extent, that I'm one of those young people which... Medellin spoke about earlier, who need to learn from the elders. So I missed all the big things in South Africa. I missed the apartheid. I missed the 1976, <laughs> 77 revolutions. I missed my first election, so I didn't vote for Mandela, and I wish I had. And I voted for everybody else after that, and I feel sorry for that. Um, <laughs> but I think for me, the, 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 the victory for young people at this point in time is we have a different way of understanding what the struggle should be mm. um, and, it, and what it should be about. So I heard um, Arch um, speaking, I mean, speaking passionately about what they viewed as a struggle against um, and what in our times is a struggle for. Um, and, and, and for me, that's, that's very telling and that's very persuasive in many ways. Um, but I think that the danger that exists in the new environments of movements and human rights internationally, um, the biggest threat to the human rights movement now are our own governments. <laughs> um, so we can talk about the grand plans, grand conventions. In my country at the moment, <coughs> like Arch was saying earlier, we've, we are going to be in the process of fighting government on the Protection to Information Bill, where in the Constitution it allows um, for um, access to information. So the constitution, constitution says you must have access to information um, as long as that information is not detrimental to, and I mean, we can list what it would be detrimental to. But then you get a, you get a government that is elected by the majority, um, and the majority of those people would be the black people. Um, and so race and class, like Jackie highlighted in the morning, plays a very important role in how societies nowadays <sighs> 
want to invoke the struggles of the past. And I think most of the times we do that to the detriment of the bigger picture. We, we, we're sitting with a problem where, um, like Arch said, a, a nomination to a certain position is about who you are affiliated to and who do you know best in the particular positions and not on how best you can deliver um, on the service. We're privatizing services. We're not making them public as the public services should be available. So for me, those are new things. The threat that we have in South Africa and probably in the continent or internationally are the governments that we elect. So because the place. government doesn't like, you mentioned about the freedom of information. Does the yeah. government doesn't like what you as a human rights activist is putting on the agenda? I'll tell you a quick example. Um, and and, and I'm, the reason I'm why I asked it, I want to ask yeah. whether, you know, you, we, you talked about information, of course yeah. you are fighting on the, you know, the anti-AIDS campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Are you putting other issues like poverty, like yeah. economic inclusion, are those on your agenda as well? Um, and what the, would the government say about that if you try to focus on they that? They would not necessarily be on the agenda of the treatment action campaign, but we work with partners who are doing a variety of other issues. And I think that is how the struggles of human rights should be linked. So he was saying, you should let the organizations that do what they know best do it. Mm. I think in our context, it is about expanding beyond. So you can set an example on how you mobilized on access to treatment for people who live with HIV. But you can broaden it and work with organizations like SERI <coughs> to speak about access to water and housing, which relates to how people are vulnerable to illnesses like HIV. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a it's coalition building. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm. Um, but but what, is, what is becoming problematic in our country um, in the last two weeks, for an example, is the government is moving towards shutting down civil society organizations and organizations that are doing human rights work. Now you look back and you think this is the ANC that fought for the rights to freedoms, all sorts of freedoms. But in the recent weeks, it is about these civil society organizations that are funded by the whites, by the Americans, by the, it is not about our own people who have elected us holding us accountable. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Angela Kidjo, you've been dying to speak. No. Grammy Award winning um, singer, all. of course, you know, you're, she's known to many of you, but she also has an organization called Batonga, which is dedicated to trying to get more girls into schools in Africa. Who could be against that? But ironically, a lot of girls are kept out of school because the family says we need them to work, we need them to help the parents, they're part of the economy. Well, when I started Bat Batonga, I basically have to say that it's a mother, actually, in a con one of the countries I was visiting with UNICEF, that come to me, begging me, saying to me, the MDG is focusing on primary education. What about a girl when they finish the primary education? You know very well, you grew up in this continent, that if you finish school and you sit around and you're under, under the nose of your father, he's going to marry you, you can cash up your life. Mm. We want our girl to stay in school. Who's going to help us for secondary education? And I start struggling with that. And right at the same time, Wangari Matai has been nominated for the um, Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize. And I said to myself, we can blame in Africa everybody we wanted to. But if we don't dig, put our hand and dig deep and start turning the tide, no one's going to do it for us. And it started with education. Not only primary education, but secondary education. Because we need women to be in a very higher position, to be able to help prevent disaster to happen to the children of Africa, and also for the women's right. We're talking about human rights. What about the women's right? Are women considered equal human beings as men? The question remains. Because the right of the women in many, many parts of the world doesn't not even taken into account. Most of the women that I, most of the time I, I come to talk to, some of them never spoke to their husband. They were never allowed to say what they want to. They, were never even, they never even think about having sex with their husband could be pleasant. It was always perceived as a duty. So there you have it, in the bed, what gave us the next generation and real deep intimacy of two humankind, there's no human right respect. Your children are born and you don't even know. All you know about that child, you love that child, is only pain. No pleasure at all. The men can have his pleasure, but women in the world, you can sit back, take your ticket, you have time to come back. And it strikes me every year and every time I go to Africa and I start speaking to my sisters, to my brothers, Africans, I'm like, we are beyond human being rights in Africa. Because if you look at the international community, okay, let's put it back here. 
When a company from a rich country comes to Africa, the only agenda is to make profit. It's not for the people from the, of the country where they are staying to be developed. No education, no economical growth. They keep the society as it is. Within the profit they make every year, there's a percentage that goes toward corruption. So I am all for organization working together in the world to, to address the human right issues. But when, for example, you, you mean you've chosen schools, now, it's one thing to argue, and it, the, the evidence is incontrovertible, that more girls being educated is good in so many different ways. Good for the girl, good for the family, good for society. But you take that argument even further and say it's good for the economy because Absolutely. they will be active members of the society. They will help you know, be productive members of, of the Absolutely. society. And then we're getting back to the premise of our, of our last session, which is the economic inclusion. If you don't educate girls, that becomes mothers. How can you educate the men? We are the one that educate men. Men, before they become men, they were a little boy. So how do we educate the boys, the men to be our partner, not our enemy, that we always stomp on us to get their way through? Every time I go around, everything I've taken, every path I've took, I always come to the realization that if we do not educate the girls in Africa, we will sink, and the world will sink with us. Education is at the forefront of human rights, okay? Education is at the forefront of economical growth. Education is at the forefront of demo democracy. What are you talking about? You're talking to people that are hungry hmm. about democracy, about human rights? They are not educated to understand that to work with you as an organization to fight for their own rights, it links to all the well-being. So the, we are in Africa, basically, we have to start from scratch. If there's no education, there's no future for Africa whatsoever. And the future goes through women. Right, good. I think that's something we would, we would all agree on. And Madeleine Albright said in the last session, people want to vote, but they also, they also want to eat. And they need, oh, yeah. they need to eat. <laughs> Let's bring back in a, a question that Ken had raised at, at the beginning, is that if you ask a question, if you want a situation to change, someone has to be held accountable. You have to address <clears throat> The, the, the problem to somebody. Balakrishnan Rajgopal, you're the head of justice at hum, and human rights at MIT. It's a big title, so we expect big answers from you. The, Good luck, buddy. It, is Only it, a program. Is it, is it, is it easier? Not, I mean, it's never easy, of course, but when you can focus on the government, elites, people who have an address, is it easier than when you have to address the broad mass of people who may be dealing through institutions like churches or councils or unions, or does it make, you know, back to the point about it's not easy, is it? Well, no one expects it to be easy, but mm -hmm. how do you address these issues then if it's going to be put on the agenda in a much, in a much more coherent way? Right. Um, when I find out about it, I can send an email to everybody. <laughs> uh, and uh, tweet us, tweet it in tweet. Facebook tweet. too. Tweet, under <laughs> 120 <laughs> words. Um, the dilemma for the human rights movement, I think, is this, on the economic and social rights issues. So gone are the days when Human Rights Watch needed to be persuaded to take on human economic and social rights. They've been doing it for years now. 18 years. 18 years. Um, most human rights groups actually have taken on economic and social rights as part of their agenda, and they have been pushing. Yet the world is seeing more and more inequity, mm. and yet there is social economic disparities increasing, as Secretary Albright said, while the number of poor people who have been lifted out of poverty in absolute terms is very impressive. In fact, there is vast inequality within countries. Also, that there is the problem of what um, I would call as precarious living. Mm -hmm. um, more and more people living in conditions where they're not sure if the next illness in the family, the next emergency that happens, the next accident, would essentially tip the family over into poverty. That's basically where people are living most of the time. And the current day reality, the way in which the system works, the economic systems work in most countries, don't seem to be designed to find a structural way out of it. And the human rights um, community, uh, I think, is as much in the dark as, uh, say, the development community is. Um, in what because sense of just knowing, not knowing where to start? on such a huge no, problem. They, I know. think the human rights community knows where to start. We start with the law, 
because in the end, human rights is a law-based project. Yeah. Yeah. But then the problem with the economic and social <laughs> rights is that yeah. you have to go beyond law. Yeah, that's the area that I would Don't you love the the they disagree with you, but they still mm. smile. But the revolution. <laughs> So the revolutions also lead to law. Now, you know, most of, much of the focus of the revolution yes, is true. on law. We can have an argument about whether that's actually the right strategy or not. Okay, hold that thought but, because I, uh -oh. I've had I've had got you had a smile, a sort of yeah, 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 a, a sort yeah, of yeah. forced smile on one side, a big smile on the other. <laughs> a very brief point to, to pick up on to, to further his to pick up where he his thread. What did you want to say in response? So that, uh, this is the argument that came in the morning as well that human rights has largely been seen as a a legal project. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it might have been true. I'm, I'm not sure where that comes from. It might have been the <laughs> elders' project. <laughs> but where I come from, and, and, unless, unless the rights that we are all advocating for are actually understood by the people on the project itself, they actually mean nothing. Well, this, yeah, we're getting back to the point about how, where are the where are the voices? Why are they not being heard? And how do you hear those voices? Okay, Kosam, tell us what you think. The smile <laughs> is not enough. <laughs> That's yes. the no, no, I. Uh, not okay. everyone can have a revolution. You've got to say, if every, if every, we, we, if every, if every, if every people had too. to wait for a revolution no, to free no. them from uh, poverty, we all, it would be. We all can have a revolution yes. if we have the guts to do so. If we want to get out of the comfort zone we are in, we can have a revolution. We put in power people that are the leaders of the world. We can take them out. But if you don't stand up, you are chopped liver. They walk on you like, hmm. Yes, I mean, that's the truth. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You can say it started here. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, and we will come here when yes, we're done with I'm leading the and, uh, revolution, man. Come on, let's go. <laughs> no, I think, okay, I, uh, of course, had you asked, I mean, had we had this conversation last year, I would have probably given a different answer. I would have mm -hmm. probably agreed. Uh, but that's interesting. That's it. Reimagining. Yeah, you, can, you can imagine it. That, that, that is the amazing thing about the absolutely. last year. We've been, we can imagine in different ways beyond what we would have considered possible. Yeah. No, no. I'm, I'm a different person by mm -hmm. what happened. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm sure you are as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Me but, too. Uh, I mean, uh, I think I... Uh, <laughs> she hasn't even had it No, my vision of the world has changed. Yeah. Since the Arab uh, uh, uprising, yeah. I'm like, whoa, anything is possible. Yes, so there is something about seeing, imagining ourselves, if you want, as a, um, as a professional cadre of uh, human rights experts, investigators. Our job is to analyze very complicated uh, <laughs> problems. And then once we... Um, In air-conditioned offices with <laughs> maps on the wall. No, no, not necessarily. Yes. <laughs> but once we're done, once we figure out the complicated problem, identify the perpetrator, then our job is to simplify the story, is to tell people a compelling story so that we can get media attention. Media attention would generate pressure on policymakers who would reform themselves. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, uh, right now, I mean, the moment of you know standing there on Tahrir Square or in my home city in Alexandria and just looking at the hundreds of thousands of people, truly humbling. I I would never you know become the same person again. I felt that you know, you know, forget about the theory of change for a while. Um, and, <laughs> you know, sorry. <laughs> I, <laughs> But uh, really, I mean, we are just, you know, <laughs> ones among hundreds of thousands of agents of social change. And unless we see the Human Rights Project as a project of social change, as part of the struggle for social change, then we're going to spend, you know, the rest of our times, you know, Talk. producing these very complicated mm. studies. But yeah. as you said, it would not have an impact on the world. And then since the revolution, I've been, because, because you know, state security in investigations are not as... Um, uh, visible as they used to be, so I'm able for the first time to travel around Egypt and you know to organize meetings to talk to the uh, you know uh, com local communities. And there is an unprecedented surge in volunteerism, civic engagement, youth organizing that never existed. I mean, there was so much potential in this country that was suppressed, mm. and it's beautiful when I travel to the south of the country. And and in the south, in Upper Egypt, the most impoverished part uh, of Egypt, you know, Luxor, Aswan, and in between. You know, it is the same groups of young activists that, you know, spend time trying to figure out the electoral system and organize themselves to observe the elections and report on them. 
and they are the same people that participated in the protests that brought down Mubarak. And then the next morning, you know, they organized a demonstration against the um, uh, civil uh, trials of civilians before military courts. In the evening, they join meetings with the teachers that are planning their national strike. And then, you know, the, the next day, they are working to fix, you know, one of the most pressing problems, the lack of subsidized bread. Mm -hmm. And the way they do it is, I mean, it, it's too complicated for any of us mm -hmm. to figure out why the government subsidizes bread so heavily, flour to make bread so heavily, and yet people can't find it and they kill themselves to find it. And the first thing they think about is exactly the same way that they think about election observation is they, they count the number of bakeries that, provide, that, that sell subsidized bread, and then they appoint one monitor for each of these bakeries to make sure that the subsidized flour is not being smuggled to be sold in the black market, mm. and to make sure that yeah. the bakeries yeah. are open for, this, for, you know, mm. for, for the well, minimum practical... amount of hours to yes. people. And these are the same people that are training to uh, observe elections and campaigning against military trials of civilians. So I can you know, spend a very long time talking about how they're Everything mm. is interrelated, but for these, you know, 22-year-olds in Aswan, in the middle of poverty, they, they it is completely clear. It's yes. complicated for us only. Okay, now I see this is this. We're getting we're, we're getting <laughs> we're getting to dangerous. We started off with people saying, you know, well, yes, yes, it's really important, but so difficult. And then we have Hussam saying, don't forget about the struggle. Just have a revolution, and we'll solve all the problems. <laughs> this is not going to be the way forward for the human rights movement. It is hard. I know you want to say something, but let's start focusing on how do you do it? What is the mm. instrument? Look, exactly. Amnesty International came up with letter writing to get people out of prisons. Greenpeace came up with, you know, jumping on boats to, to bring up environmental <coughs> issues. Tell us what you're going to do, Ken, to get onto this very amorphous, difficult, but absolutely crucial issue of addressing, you know, who's responsible for poverty and let's focus on this, this area. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the whole premise of this, um, meeting today beyond conventions. Uh, it's premised on the view that it's about conventions now and that mm. we have to take the next step. It hasn't been about conventions for decades. Mm. And I think we should recognize that. Mm. You know, I mean, yes, the, the, the conventions did provide a certain degree of legitimacy. But you know, I, I'll speak here as a lawyer to mm -hmm. say the law doesn't really matter. Doesn't? No. Um, the, because I mean, for a number of reasons. Does. No, even good, let's say, you know, let's say you have a law that says you can't discriminate against women, okay? We know that there's a law that says that. And, you know, let's say Human Rights Watch were to put out a report and say, you know, the Saudi government is discriminating against women. Mm -hmm. And your average Saudi would say, yay! Mm -hmm. You know, and so the law doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the men here, the yes. women wouldn't, but, but even a lot of the women would. You know, in other words, the, what matters is social expectations. You know, governments or people in power um, have to pay attention to social expectations because even dictatorships require legitimacy. Mm. Um, now, you know, the law will guide people's moral judgments, but what matters in the end is the moral judgments. And so there have been times when, you know, we've had to create law because governments have exploited the ambiguity in the law to get away with things, and so we needed to create a law, say, to ban landmines, mm. you know, to show them this was clearly wrong. But other times, you know, the law is there already, and the fight is not about the law. The fight is about... Um, building social expectations to roughly correspond with the law. I mean, let me just give you a few examples. The, um, you know, we recently did a project at Human Rights Watch looking at female genital mutilation in Iraqi Kurdistan, mm. which was a, a widespread problem. Now, there's no you know, law that says explicitly female genital mutilation is bad. Mm. There, but there, you know, there's language about um, you know, right to privacy, right to physical integrity, things of that sort, um, which is ignored because you know, in certain parts of the world, this is just what's done. And so in that circumstance, the key was how do you start changing social expectations? The most important thing that we did was to get a um, local imam to issue a fatwa saying that Islam does not require FGM. Mm -hmm. And that spoke directly mm. to public expectations. And when you change those, then you begin to change practices. I'll give another example. We, we've, a major priority of Human Rights Watch over the last like, five years has been looking at the treatment of migrant domestic workers, who tend to be women from Indonesia, Philippines, Sri Lanka, who go, they tend to go to the Middle East or to Hong Kong or to Singapore or Malaysia, but you know, kind of wealthier countries. Uh, now, many people have this view that they're just bringing these young women into the family and they shouldn't be treated like workers with rights. They're just members of the family. 
and, and you know, the image is we're just going to you know, educate them and treat them as another yeah, member. Right. But of course, the reality is they're working 24-7. They don't get days off. They're sexually abused. You know? And so um, working with a PR firm, Human Rights Watch launched a campaign, which we ran in both um, Lebanon and Kuwait, two receiving countries, um, where we pictured you know, a, a clearly elite woman, but dressed in a maid's outfit. And mm -hmm. the whole campaign was, imagine yourself in her shoes. Okay. You know, and the point is, again, to change public expectations. Okay, and, you're and talking about change, yeah, changing public expectations, changing social expectations. Right. It's all part of, uh, of the change that, that has to happen. But what we, we are really wanting to discuss here is changing social realities. If, yeah. as Bala Christian yeah. says, so many human rights organizations, so many conventions, everyone's talking about it, and yet the world is becoming a poorer and Absolutely. more unequal place. So when you sit here, Kenneth Roth, and with a lot of the resources of a big human rights organization, do you say, well, actually, we have to try to find a new strategy. Yes, we'll do all the stuff that we do and we've been doing for the last 18 years, but we've got to recognize this is the problem. We really must put more resources. How do you do it? What is the strategy practically for focusing on? Who are your allies? What are your instruments? But do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say you that. You now have the MIT answer for us. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. Um, the Carlos Romulo, is quoted here. That's was very know, interesting, yes. On page 25, mm. nations will rise and fall, but equality remains ideal, etc., etc. Uh, uh, read, read it Romulo, through, just read it through, read, read it, it to the end. It's, um, it's what we're talking the about. The universal aim is to achieve respect for the entire human race, not just for the dominant few. Now, you see that his focus is on the entire human race. Mm. He has a global perspective because he was a representative of the Philippines to the Bandung Conference. The Bandung Conference, in case people remember, was um, the first ever conference of Afro-Asian countries in Bandung, Indonesia, 1955. Wow. That was the birth of anti-colonial developmental nationalism. Because colonialism had been already collapsing, and nation states were becoming independent. But the thing that actually made it important, that particular conference important, was because these countries, for the first time ever, mm -hmm. got together on their own without any mm. Europeans present in the room and said, look, we are going to determine our own path forward. And the formula for achieving that, for prosperity, inclusive economic and social growth, is development. Mm. So mm -hmm. there has always been in the post-World War II period, there have been two particular formula for, you know, if you want to call it advancement in economic political terms. One is human rights. The other is development. Mm -hmm. And, and are they know, both heading in the same direction? We, no. Not necessarily. You know, there is, I think Secretary Albert also referred to that for a long time there was this debate whether development should come first or, or human rights. There was this debate about whether to, <coughs> to make an omelet, you have to break eggs, and mm. so on and so forth. But, um, <laughs> but I think you know, where we are right now with the human rights movement is this. They realize the importance of economic and social rights. They've taken it on board. But to bring it about, um, I have to say, changing social expectations is important, but that alone doesn't deliver the mm. goods. For example, what changing the, what social does, expectations. What does? What does? Social expe changing mm. social expectations won't create jobs. So what example. does? What and what policy, should the human rights movement do? Policy focus. Mm. Um, change <laughs> in the structure of economic um, relationships. Change in property ownership. Uh, land relations. Absolutely. Bringing about more distributive mm. outcomes including through the use of law, but not enough. But to abandon law, I think, is also a bad mm. idea. Yeah, because, you know, you but need to but just, oh, I just, oh, just oh, Okay, just, oh, just one sec. I just want to bring in, you've heard, I mean, Hussam is the one who said, well, you know, we address those issues, but we have to say that the, the, the record is mixed. I just want to see a show of hands here. You've been listening to these advocates and activists. They're all incredibly passionate about what they do. How many of you think, a show of hands, that the the human rights movement has to shift focus, is partly failing in their mandate to try and address the most important human rights issues. So put your hands up. I just want to see what, what you're thinking when you're sitting in your seats. How many of you feel that there is an element of failure, that something has to change? Let's see your hands. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Number okay. one here. Okay. Me too. So you all do. So do we, do you want to, do we, does anyone want to, to, to make a point? Yes, it isn't, but we're talking here about as you move forward, you have to do more to focus more on this issue. The world changes, the landscape changes, we have to change. Okay. And we've got to change strategies, we've got new technologies, we have all kinds of different options, so it means we change. Okay. So how do you want to change? Okay. No, it's not either can or, I, yeah. Can I say something before we get into this? Uh, 
As she said, the world has changed. And since the end of colon colonialism, and since the, the end of uh, Cold War, we, I mean, most of the stuff haven't changed. People have, are moving. We are in a global village. And the wealth of the earth is in one hand, not in the others. How do we determine? One hand, you mean it's concentrated? It's in, concentrated mm -hmm. in one hand. How do we determine human rights without somebody having food? Without company, I mean, the African farmer cannot compete with the farmer from Europe or America because they have subsidies. Hmm. I mean, the, right there, we have something that is not working. Because you asking, the, the international community is asking them to compete, but they can't sell the stuff. Hmm. And on the committee that judge the quality of what you sell, you still have the rich country sitting on that committee. They decide from the beginning before your merchandise goes out that you're legit or not legit. So there is a double standard world in which we live in that is collapsing right now. If you want to save capitalism, we got to be more fair. Mm -hmm. We got to share equally the development. We cannot hold in one hand what is good for us. We tell the world, do as we say, don't do what we do, and don't look at us. How that can that work? How can we live in a world of right and peace when there's no moral um, 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 responsibility in respecting other people. Mm. For me, the most important word that defines human rights in our society is respect. Okay. And we have lost respect for people's lives because we see it as um, collateral damage to profit. If you say that doing business <laughs> is more important than saving people's lives, mm -hmm. then we have no human rights. But where does this, you, you mentioned Hold on, but, I'm yeah. not done. Yeah. When, yes. I, I have to, <laughs> I'm not done because I come from a poor country and I've suffered that. When I was going to school in Benin, there were days my father was the only one with a paycheck. There were days we have no food because somebody in Washington or Paris or somewhere decided that today we don't have food. How can we sit here and talk about human rights if we don't go back in history and say, let's change completely what we written, have been written on international trade? and international policy and diplomacy. I am a human being with the same right as an American, as a French citizen, but I don't have that in the world I am living in. I'm living in a global village, and every time I have to come, every time I go somewhere, I have to justify how good I am because I'm black. You are judged by who you are because that perspective is the way it is. How did human rights deal with racism purely in the work, workplace? Mm. I travel around the world, and people come to me. When they talk to me, I don't see them as white. I don't see them as black. I don't see them as yellow. I don't care the skin color you have. I don't care. I give a damn. All I care about is how we can interact. How can we share our skills? How can we talk to each other and respect each other and share our culture and share what we have that is our human spirit? Hmm. And if we don't deal with that, we don't go back and tell the leader of this world, and all the CEO of all the companies that if you don't share, you have no more company left. You won't have no more earth left. Because respecting the earth, doing green business, mm. and respecting people that consume your product is something that creates wealth. Money out of money, capitalism as it is today. We don't change it, it will fail. And I don't want it to see it fail. Because I'm a human being that wants to travel around the world, do my music. Half people come to my concert, and I want people to eat when they're hungry. Yes. I want every single child in this planet to go to bed with free meal a day. With my girls, the school where I am, my program, we give one meal for those teenagers. Mm. Because we know that that is the only meal they're going to have before they go back home. We allow them to come back in the school even when they have a child. Once, one pregnancy, not two. Why do we have to struggle so much? Why did the men have to go after a girl of 12 years old? Mm. We have to, and it's not only law, it's just common sense. We all have to sit and refuse. And when a man ref, 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 refuse to marry a woman that have go through, went through um, female genital mutilation, we will see change. Mm. Because if they are complacent with it, and they marry those girls, it's gonna continue. Very good. Very good. A lot of very good points there. And most of all, three meals a day and people going to school. Does someone else want to add a comment into this conversation? The gentleman in the back. I, th <clears throat> I think one of the problems for me is that I don't think poverty should be seen 
so much as a human rights problem, I think there's a human rights dimension to it uh, as a political problem. And it's about politics and the political decisions societies make about how they allocate resources. So you asked, I think, earlier about practical solutions. If I think of the most equal societies in the world, I think of Scandinavia, and they have personal tax rates of 45, 50, 55 percent, which everybody pays, including the rich, including the middle class, including everybody in this, in this room who's working. And for that, they get decent health care, they get a decent public education system, and they get decent social security and benefits. Now, that may not be the solution to poverty that a lot of people like, because it means giving up a lot of your personal income to states that you don't necessarily trust. And it wouldn't be an argument, I guess, that would go down very well in the United States, for example. But that's a society that has got a solution to poverty. And I've yet to see, and it combines it with open markets and a capitalist system and businesses that flourish with high levels of employment, very low levels of unemployment, and which have been fiscally responsible and financially responsible, so they have a very stable financial system and stable banks. Now, that's one solution, and yeah. I'd put it on the table that that's one solution worth mm. thinking about. Yes. Yeah. If there are others, it's, it's I don't know where they are, because those are the most equal societies in the world, where the poor have the greatest degree of protection. Thank Absolutely. you. We we'll take another question or comment from this side of the room, the lady. It's actually a real question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, the work I do is on economic and social rights in the United States. Um, you know, which is a which is not always a central part of the conversation. Obviously, the U.S. is deeply unequal, <coughs> and I don't need to explain the problems to anyone in this room. But my question for the panel is, in terms of the global struggle. How do you see the relevance or the importance, or, the, or, the, or if you see it as not relevant, the struggle to legitimize and bring economic and social rights to this country? Mm. Okay. Um, Hussam? Sure. Um, on, on the question of, I mean, it's, it's, a, bit, uh, it's a bit of a dated uh, debate, um, uh, frankly. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think all human rights violations stem from political decisions. There is someone in power that is making a certain decision. Um, what the conventions tell us, the little that they tell us about um, economic and social rights is that governments are under an obligation to um, um, mobilize resources to the, to the maximum of their available resources to um, meet their obligations under these rights. Um, as someone in Egypt that watched the debate around um, Obamacare, uh, from Egypt. Um, I mean, the debate about healthcare reform was so clearly about, I mean, this is not about the US not having the resources to have a functional health system. Mm. This was clearly about a decision, a conscious decision by people in power not to spend the maximum available resources that they have on improving the health of their people. This, for me, makes it a human rights issue. It's and it doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily have to, I mean, um, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty are increasingly doing very useful work on economic and social rights in our region, in Egypt as well. Uh, Amnesty just report, uh, issued a report about the rights of slum dwellers in Egypt uh, with an excellent title, We Are Not Garbage, uh, that goes through, that, that, mm -hmm. that follows the old um, uh, methodology of simply recording the testimonies of people that live in slums and then presenting these, uh, uh, the patterns of violations. Um, uh, and, and Human Rights Watch is, is doing the same on um, maternal health uh, in, in some countries. But I think there are issues that are much less obvious that are still, for me, so clearly human rights um, issues. Uh, so our current project, for instance, is looking at the amount of money that um, Mubarak's government and the interim government after Mubarak are spending to subsidize energy for um, um, cement companies, for uh, steel companies uh, that, are, were, of course, were all owned by people that were, that were close to the Mubarak family and continue to have uh, you know, political influence. And it's, I mean, frankly, it's a bit easy to show, uh, we just never looked, but it's a bit easy to show that it's a huge percentage of public spending. Uh, uh, it is uh, going to companies that are already achieving huge profits mm -hmm. so, uh, for um, so goods awesome. that will not go more expensive if the subsidies, the energy subsidies go less. Mm -hmm. And if you compare these to the government spending on education and health, it is it Nothing. is not difficult to show that this is true, sir, a political decision, but a political decision not to spend the maximum available resources. Hmm. But I think, um, I, I think just be before this, I mean, I mean the, 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 
uh, I'll go back to this uh, in, in the very end about okay. the, about the, the, the methodology, yeah. about the, whether the human <laughs> rights methodology <laughs> is um, okay. We'll, we'll utilizing the best okay. one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I not all the time respect orders. <laughs> Um, but I, 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 I think the important thing, which, which is what he's just said now, um, is, and this is highlighted in many ways, human rights are a very contested terrain. Mm. And the way that we change how we do business going forward, and, and this is my, just my, I mean, on top of my head analysis, is the way that we've organized human rights before has largely been in posh offices with good furniture, with the right people to analyze data with the right people to raise I the issues when we think the they need to be raised. Um, I think the lessons that I've learned in the organization that I you work appeal. in is that if, if, if the knowledge is owned by, so if, if, if as a person living with HIV, I know what my rights are as a person living with HIV, but as a human being first, as a person who lives with HIV, as an active citizen in my country, it goes beyond <coughs> just an analysis somewhere that says five million people are living with HIV. They need it. It, it is about my existence, my human it dignity every day. So true. for me, that is Not how enough. we need to do things differently going forward. It, it is okay to have good offices that mm -hmm. I like, but it is more important to make the ownership of these programs by the people, not for, by the people that we are advocating with, not mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the big thing. It's but also, um, w w what is also important is to understand that we hold much power than the governments we elect. Absolutely. We might not have realized it yet, and maybe Arab Spring, which is the new word I've had today, has given us some of the things to do, but it does not always have to be like that. It is about active citizenship in holding them accountable when they're looking for our votes. Mm -hmm. It true. doesn't end there. After the votes, what is it that we require from them? We've just partnered in a case with Seri um, at the back. Mm. And, and, and I mean, being able to link these struggles beyond just health, beyond just water, which is privatized throughout the world, mm -hmm. and our governments are saying this is the basic right, throughout privatizing housing, which is a basic human right in our country, through privatizing yeah. everything else and nationalizing mines, which is what is important for our government. They want to nationalize mm -hmm. mines so that we get gold and platinum and whatever, but we don't get the water and the housing and the healthcare that we need. So, so there has to be that, 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 that understanding beyond that we will organize somewhere here. So we'll come to the US and organize and think imaginatively about human rights. Mm. It would be about how do I, mm. as a citizen, not mm. as a person who can use a computer and write in oh, these papers, right. but generally at that level, do I take ownership of many things? And I've seen how young people in my country have changed the perception of, mm. of government. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the young people that are linked to the ANC, but generally young people who take the struggle, there's everyday struggles on social justice, on education, on health, which is beyond AIDS now, and, and draw a bigger picture for ourselves and say, mm -hmm. in 2012, when the ANC goes to elections, what do I want to see emerging from there? And definitely, okay. I do not want Zuma as a president. Good. So, so I can be quoted yeah. on that. That's no, it. No, okay. Now, I'm being asked like to, to, to wrap up. I just want to give just, it, really, it has to be a bullet point. One last thing to, to go away with. We're not just ending our session. We're coming to the end of the day. We're going to, of course, hear Angelique sing with her passions. Um, just one very brief comment from each of you about how do you move forward and where do you move forward? Ken Roth. Well, there's been some discussion about you know, economic development and human rights as if they're contrasts. And, and it's true, sometimes they are set up that way. But I, I think what we've learned is that um, there are different ways to measure economic development. And if you do it in sort of you know, macroeconomic terms, your GDP grew by X percent this year, you're actually are not telling yourself very much about how the most impoverished segments of society are faring. And that's why I think a social and economic rights analysis, which does focus on the worst off segments, is a, a critical essential supplement to uh, just a kind of broad economic development perspective on things. Okay, Valakrishan? Uh, I think, you know, I, I would Why simply... Why did you jump? Well, you gave Sorry. your last... No, you already... You started. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's going to give me the last one. You're word. the leader. <laughs> <laughs> this man is going to, you know... Well, I don't want to say kill me because we're at a human rights convention, but he's, <laughs> <laughs> it looks good kill. Yes. Valakrishan. I mean, oh, wait, I'm sorry, that was your last... I can give you five more yeah, No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, just on the theme of this panel, I think, you know, it's... Um, what I think I, I want to leave people with the idea that, you know, if social and economic inclusion is important, human rights is, the, is where you start, economic and social rights, but that alone is not enough. You have to push the conversation from human rights to justice. Mm. And justice is larger idea 
and encompasses many other things than just human rights. If you take, for example, very practically, uh, the Treatment Action Campaign's own focus you know, on um, right to health, you know, uh, in the end, if you have to think about where are the levers of influence to bring about the change that you need, mm. in the end, it's not just the national courts, it's not just you know, the Human Rights Committee, it's not just the traditional human rights bodies, but the WTO. Mm. And WTO, getting the WTO to adopt the Doha Declaration mm. on Public Health. So there are different ways in which, so what happened in Doha, I want to suggest, okay. was a human rights event, okay. right? But we won't get the import of it if we confine ourselves to the idea that economic and social exclu inclusion is going to happen only through human rights, mm. okay. traditionally defined. Okay. You've got Good. to have a multi Focused. Two sentences, Sosam. My two sentences. <laughs> uh, I, I think, um, again, uh, because we're trying to reimagine our work, uh, we've been thinking a lot about how much we contributed or failed. I mean, many of the questions that you asked us today uh, to you know, the, the events leading up to January. And I think collectively, as a movement, we need to reconsider our most uh, commonly used uh, and most uh, resourced uh, tools. Um, if you look at the human rights movement in the contemporary practice, the most common tools we use are um, research and investigation, uh, policy advocacy, strategic litigation in courts, and human rights education. And if you look at these tools, you will see that we're either studying the people or speaking to governments on their behalf, speaking to courts on their behalf, or educating them. Something is wrong. I realize that we need to rethink these tools, and we need to start rethinking our own role as agents among equals, not as a professional elite trying to do something to the people, but mm. trying to really work with the people. And this is something that I think we need, I mean, we, we need to start slowly shifting resources um, uh, to, in the direction of community mobilization, constituency building, of working with the people, because that, frankly, if we're concerned about impact, that achieves, achieves much faster impact and yes. much more lasting impact as well. And that is something that the revolution has made us uh, you know, reconsider a bit. Okay. Yes. Okay. Angelique, he took four sentences, so that means you only get one <laughs> sentence. No, I got, I got more than that. Gets to sing and, gonna, and you're going to get to sing, so very brief, because we don't um, want to take time away from your okay. singing. So, for me, there would be no democracy, no human rights, no peace without education. Mm. More people are educated, more they know the rights, more they know that every action, every, and everything you do comes with consequences. We have to be responsible toward ourselves. We have to respect ourselves to be able to our respect other people. If we respect our lives, automatically we will respect the life of other people. We have to go, go back to the basic value that we all have in common, that, that, that is a life is more important than anything and is more important than profit, than government, than, than um, corporation, than profit. Money cannot save us from death. Thank you. And for me, my last word is just to say, well done in the last 75 years. A lot of you here do difficult and in some countries dangerous work. And so I just want to say it's a job well done, and I wish you well for the next 75 years. Yes. <laughs>